Good morning, church. My name is Joe, and I'm privileged to do the call to worship this morning. Uh, please stand for the reading of the Word of God as we read this morning from the book of Colossians, chapter number 1, verses 15 through 20. And it says this, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things are held together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the beautiful cross. Let's pray. Gracious God, we just come before you this morning. Lord, we just thank you for gathering us here together, Lord. And Father, as this text tells us this morning, Lord, you are the beginning, you are the end, the first and the last, Lord. Everything comes from you, Father, and we just thank you that we can come and gather here and worship here and praise your holy name and give your name glory and honor, Father. Lord, we just thank you that in Christ we are made new, we are full because of all that he has done, Lord. We just ask that you bless our time and bless our worship, and it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Was buried beneath my sin, and who can carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you, and I was breathing, but not. Alive, all my failures I tried to hide. It was my tomb till I made you call my name, and I ran out of that grave. Into your glorious day, you call my name, and I ran out of that grave, out of the darkness, into your glorious day. And now you move. Has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old name you, Jesus, when I met you, was when you called my name. sin was heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I need a shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing, and your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open, cause when 
to have Robbie on the drums and Stephen on the guitar. It in fact is a glorious day as we gather together as God's people to celebrate Jesus left the, the glories of heaven, took on human flesh and came down to be here with us and then lived a perfect life, died on a cross, ascended to heaven, but then glorious, he's coming back one day, amen? Amen. amen to take us home uh, with him. And he did all of that for you and for me. And uh, we praise the Lord for his love and his grace. Well, let's sing uh, to this Jesus that we love.
Father, we thank you that you are calling. You are calling to us, each one, to your side. What a Savior. Aren't you wonderful? Alleluia. Christ is risen. We bow down before you. We know you are Lord of all. We sing Alleluia. Christ is risen. Thank you for bearing the cross for each one of us today. Thank you for the crown that represents what victory you've won for each one of us. We pray that you would just bless our hearts, our minds, as we spend time studying your word, as we rejoice in the truth that brings life to each one of us. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And so we turn to the Word of God uh, today. We continue in the Gospel of Matthew. We move uh, from the Sermon on the Mount into the eighth chapter. And, uh, and so I want you to t t attend uh, to the, the reading of His Word. Um, we ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds and our lives um, as we would hear His Word today. The Word of God. And when Jesus came down from the mountain... And that would be the, where he gave the Sermon on the Mount. When he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him, knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priests. And offer the gift of that Moses commanded for a proof to them. And when he entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. But only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. And when Jesus heard this, he marveled, and he said to those who followed him, truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth and to the centurion Jesus said go let it be done for you as you have believed and the servant was healed at that very moment and when Jesus entered Peter's house he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with fever he touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and began to serve him that evening they brought to him many who were opposed but oppressed by uh, demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word, and he healed all who were sick. And this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah, he took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Amen. Uh, throughout the summer, we have been focused in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, the, the teaching of Jesus about the ethics of the kingdom of God. What does it mean to live the Jesus life, a Jesus-centered life, focused on life, having been redeemed through His finished work on the cross? How do we then live? And so we focused on that, but before He gave us the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew writes in chapter 4, verse 23, that Jesus went throughout all Galilee teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. And then he began with the Sermon on the Mount and uh, tells us of the, the great teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. This is the first miracle, the first healing that we encounter in the gospel of Matthew. And he, and he shifts here to how Jesus comes down from the mountain, and the great crowds follow him, and it introduces this new section that's going to run through the beginning of chapter 10 when Jesus commissions, calls out and commissions the 12 disciples. Uh, the question of chapters 8 and 9 that runs throughout 
that is being answered is, who is Jesus? Well, he's a great teacher, but is that all he is, a great teacher? Who is Jesus? And so we, we come to this section, and who is Jesus is not, there's not a more uh, important question. There is not a more life-transforming question to have answered in your life than who is Jesus Christ, and then act upon that knowledge, not just up here, but in your heart, believing and coming to trust in Him by faith. And so this is being set out here, and three miracles, one after another, are, are laid out. And the first, that of the healing of, a, of the leper, the Talmud, which is the rabbinic um, uh, collection of rabbinic uh, teachings on, on Jewish theology and, and, uh, and law uh, and how that is to be lived out, the, the Talmud says this, that cleansing a leper is akin to raising the dead. That's how unusual, how powerful, how uh, uh, astounding this miracle is. And it gives testimony to who Jesus is. In, in the strictest sense, as we read that, and, and it doesn't hit us in the same way it would of Matthew's audience uh, or those who witnessed it, uh, both the leper and Jesus were overreaching what the law said they could do. One, the leper is supposed to stay separate, but he comes right before Jesus and kneels before him. He was way out of bounds in doing that. And then Jesus touches the leper, and the law said, you don't touch a leper. That was way out of bounds, and yet Jesus is never bound by tradition, okay? He doesn't ever break God's law, but He is not bound by tradition, and here the tradition was you don't, but Jesus does. Um, and this is tremendously good news. When we read about leprosy, it, it, it kind of comes across as a living parable of sin, because the thing with sin is it makes us unclean before God. And sin separates us from God. It is the one thing that separates us from God who is holy and righteous and good and just, and our sin separates us from God. It is the one thing that will do that. Our sin is repugnant before a holy God, and yet Jesus comes, and He is not put off by our sin. And then when we come in humble repentance, He Jesus, through His Holy Spirit, touches us and cleanses us of all unrighteousness. He doesn't tell us you've got to go do some things first, get this straightened out, get your life in shape, and then come talk to me. And the leper, as he comes to Jesus, seems to have no question at all about whether Jesus can heal him. His only question is whether Jesus would be willing to do this for him. And, and just, I would say here, when we pray, when you pray, do you, do you pray with that kind of confidence when you come before the, the Lord, do you have doubts about His power to do anything? Well, Lord, if it's not too hard for you, I know I'm asking a lot, but could, or are you confident about what He can do? We don't always know what God's will is to do, and we want to be humble in that, but be bold in asking God to do great and wonderful things, uh, that Jesus is sufficient to fill our lives and to make us whole, and so we pray with that uh, certainty. And Jesus, we're told, reaches out and He touches the leper. So, by, by the understanding of the law was this, if you touch someone who is unclean, what happens? You become unclean as well. But not only does Jesus, uh, does the leper become clean, but Jesus doesn't become unclean. Jesus remains holy even as He takes upon Himself this cleansing and this change. And, and, and what a witness this is. What a, a testimony this is to who Jesus is. And I love how He does it. He does a miracle in, in probably the most unmiraculous way possible. There's no histrionics. There's no flailing around of His hands and clicking fingers and pointing and there's no emotional drama that's stirred up before. Come on, we got to get stirred up before this can happen. No, not with Jesus. 
What Jesus has is absolute compassion and absolute authority. And he stretches out his hand. That's all he does. I will be clean. There are cases where Jesus, where God does not immediately change a circumstance that's hard. Uh, it may be physical sickness. It may be some other difficulty. And, and the case I would put in point to that is in chapter 26 of Matthew, when Jesus prays in agonizing prayer that the cup of that cross be removed from him. And it is not. God's purposes as he works out for his own glory and our good cause us to trust him every step of the way. When it comes to issues of, of sickness and distress, the call is not to give in to rationalism that is common today or to a stoicism that says, I'll just suck it up and take it. That's not what it's saying at all. I don't know about you. I, I have to say I have not um, witnessed miracles often. I have seen miracles, but not often. I, I think that's why they're called miracles and not ordinaries. They're miracles, uh, tr uh, truly. I mean, we say, we use the word sometimes routinely, right? Oh, I found a parking space in the front line. It was a miracle. It was not a miracle, okay? Uh, it was a good thing, and, and I'm glad for you, but it wasn't a miracle, I mean, if you said, and then suddenly the cars just ascended out of the way and he pulled them up, that would be a miracle. So we want to be precise in how we understand that the, the, the miracles here. But I will tell you that with a, a desperate and believing faith, I will continue to cry out to God to do what only God can do. I will ask for miracles when there is no hope in any other way and to pray with a sense of the miracle behind the miracle. And what we're uh, thinking about there, what I'm thinking about is the, the miracle of the incarnation, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, as John 1.14 says. The incarnation is this mysterious miracle that is at the very heart of historic, faithful Christianity. It is central to the witness in the New Testament. And think about this, Jesus came to the Jews first. What is the hallmark belief of Judaism to this day? It's expressed in the Shema. There is one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Monotheism. There are not multiple gods. There is but one. And yet, the New Testament writers, the apostles, go forth and say that Jesus is worthy to be worshipped. We will bow and kneel before Him, and so should you, and call upon Him. How was that... Uh, how did that prevail in the New Testament? Except that the Holy Spirit was revealing God more fully as the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Word did become flesh. And so incarnation is not some esoteric kind of out there idea that Christians have, but it doesn't really matter. It matters that Jesus is fully God and fully man matters, that the two natures are united to Jesus without mixture, confusion, separation, or division, and all of that can be parsed. It all matters. But the thing is this, each nature retains its own attributes in Jesus, and so that this way, all that is in us as human beings and all that is in God as God dwells together perfectly in Jesus who is fully divine and fully human 
as our Savior. And that's why He is the proper object of our worship, of all glory going to Him. He is the perfect one to whom we would give faith and hope and love forever and ever. The false prophets that we were looking at last week at the end of chapter 7 in which Jesus said, beware, the false prophets, this is the area where they will show themselves, either in part or in full, they deny something about either the humanity of Jesus or the divinity of Jesus, or they confuse the two. They, that's the key issue. That's the miracle behind the miracles. How does the gospel of Matthew open? It tells us about the miracle of Jesus' birth, His miraculous birth, and yet a fully human birth. Jesus offers this soldier, I'll come to your house. I will come and heal him. This is unheard of. Uh, it, when we get to Acts, uh, 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 we see it was forbidden. Peter gets the call to go to see Cornelius, and he says, I, I can't go to see Cornelius. He's a Gentile. I, I can't go into his house. Remember, Peter gets this great vision of all the animals. He says, eat. And he goes, I can't eat that. That's unclean. And the vision is what God declares clean, you don't call unclean. When God is doing work in different people's lives, because Jesus comes and He crosses the chasm of, of, of race and nationality and cultures and class, all of that, He crosses all of those. Every tradition, He breaks down for the sake of the gospel. All of that is an expression of the, the great word in Hebrew, hesed, God's covenant love, God's um, uh, faithful, loving kindness and mercy being made known. This soldier responds, I, Lord, no, I'm not worthy. I am not worthy. But if you just say the word, speak the word, and it will be done. Hmm. See, he was... A soldier. He says, I, I, I understand authority. There's a lot I don't understand, but authority I get because the people under me, I say the word and they do it. And the people over me, they say the word and I do it. And if you say the word, it will be done. Charles Spurgeon says, May we know Jesus under authority. That as Jesus comes and he says, I have come to do the will of the Father. At no point are, are the two uh, uh, in, in going in different directions ever. I've come to do the will of the Father. But Spurgeon says, may we also uh, know Jesus with authority. And the Gospel of Matthew will end with Jesus saying very clearly, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, you go and make disciples. And also, Spurgeon says, but don't miss seeing ourselves as being under Jesus' authority. Lord, you tell me, you speak to me, you show me in your word and by the promptings of your Holy Spirit, I will be obedient. I'll be obedient. In the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 6, verse 30, you remember when Jesus says, Oh, you of little faith, He's talking to, to His people. Oh, you of little faith. But now, this Gentile displays a faith that's far deeper and far uh, greater, trusting in Jesus' authority completely. Church, do you trust in His authority? Will you take Him at His word and believe Him at His, at his word? At the end of chapter 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, we read that the crowds were astonished at Jesus' teaching because He taught as one with authority and not like the other teachers they had known. 
But this is the only time in Matthew where Jesus is said to be amazed or astonished. Verse 10, he marveled. He marvels at the, at the faith of this centurion. The healing of the servant really mattered to the centurion, and they certainly mattered to the servant, but that's not the primary focus of Matthew here. In fact, the miracle in many accounts of miracles in God's Word is not the primary miracle. There's a miracle behind the miracle. In verse 13, Jesus says, go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And here, that miracle is the faith of the Roman soldier, that he has come to that place to see and trust Jesus. That is a work that he couldn't just conjure up himself, that God has been at work. He sees that. And here's the contrast. The centurion, who has just maybe just met Jesus, clearly he's heard of Jesus because he comes to him, but he doesn't have a relationship with Jesus. And he says, speak the word and it will be done. Three years later, one of the disciples, Thomas, has been traveling with Jesus for three years. He has heard his teaching. He has witnessed the miracles. And then there's the cross and the burial, and the word comes of the resurrection. And in fact, the disciples are gathered there in that upper room, except for Thomas. See, when you miss church, you can miss a lot. Just saying. Thomas wasn't there, and they told him about it, and he said, oh, great. No, he said, "Uh uh-uh, unless I see with my own eyes and touch him with my own finger, I won't believe it. You see the miracle of faith there. We might like to think, well, I would be like, like him. Yeah, if that's what happened, of course that's what happened. But a lot of us are pretty pragmatic. Now, I need to see it. I I, I need some proof on this before I go wholeheartedly into it. We are called by faith to put our trust in Christ, but not a blind faith, a, a faith that's very clearly articulated. One of the dangers is that those closest to the truth, we can come to take it for granted. Just take it for granted. Yeah, I believe that Jesus uh, lived and died and rose again. I, I believe He's the Son of God. And, and I believe that cheese on tuna fish is good, and I believe, you know, it just, it, it, it just becomes just a thing instead of a statement of this, of, of this faith that is ours in Christ and that we, we hold to and live by. Matthew tells us about that at the beginning of the gospel too, chapter 2. Remember the magi from the east who see a star and they make their way, we don't know how far, but a, a considerable trip and they come to Herod and to the palace and they said, we're here to inquire about a newborn king. Anybody know anything about this? Herod sends for the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers to come and the thing is they do know. Yeah, the prophets say that would be in Bethlehem. And then how many of them go? As far as we know, none of them went. They just knew about it. Yeah, I've I've heard that. But there's no faith to follow up and to say, is God answering His? This is a promise He made of a Messiah. Is this the time? Let's go check it out. No. But the Magi did. Spurgeon says, great faith may grow where there's little soil, and no faith where everything seemed to promise and promote it. Great faith may grow in Morocco, where it seems like it's not good soil. And in places filled with churches, we languish. Faith grows cold. 
the warnings in verses 10 through 12 here. And I'll tell you what, people from the east and the west are going to come. They're going to be drawn in, and they're going to recline at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. But people who have heard that, and those names are on their lips, are going to be cast out and left behind. Remember the frightening words last week from the Sermon on the Mount, depart from me, I never knew you. That's what he's saying. There are some. We don't want to be in that number. Do you have a faith that recognizes the greatness of God's power? That goes beyond temporal healing and physical healing and good things in this life to the ultimate things. That that of truly of being saved, of having our sins forgiven, of having a relationship with God that's been established through faith in Christ Jesus, His finished work on the cross and His promise of coming again. And we live in light of that to the glory of God. The, the last miracle here, that third healing, is he goes into Peter's house. His mother-in-law is sick. He touches her. The fever immediately lifts. And what does she do? She gets up and she serves him. I would submit that's one of the best things you can do. If you have been touched by the blood of Christ uh, and, 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 and redeemed by his grace and mercy and kindness, get up and serve him. Serve Him every day. Look for ways to be of service and to love the Lord and express that love. Most often we serve Him by serving others in His name. That's what we're to do. That is the joyous expression. She didn't get up and give a speech about it. She just gets up and serves and cares. Does Jesus still touch physical illness today? When Matthew wrote this, I I believe the gospel of Matthew is before 70 A.D., before the fall of Jerusalem, uh, earlier than some would would date it. I I believe that, and there's various reasons for that. But what that would mean is that somewhere between 30, 35 years after the resurrection he is writing this, is Matthew just giving a historical account that when Jesus was on earth, he healed people? Or is this a call to trust and ask Jesus for healing grace and for His touch even now. And I would submit it's that, that latter. He wasn't just giving them some information about what Jesus did, but to encourage that. I, I will tell you that I have a pretty strong skepticism about so-called faith healers. I, I just do. I, I'm skeptical. There's various reasons for that. But I am not skeptical at all that God still heals today, that we can call upon the Lord Jesus Christ and we can ask for the Holy Spirit to touch people who are ill and with diseases of every kind, and we can call upon Him to do that. Jesus didn't have a whole bunch of histrionics to… He simply does it. It is still by the word of His power, by His will being manifest, and we trust Him for that, and we will ask our elders believe in that. James 5 says, if you're sick, to to call for the elders who will come and pray over you and anoint you with oil as they lay hands on you and, and, and pray for your healing. Our elders believe that, and they do that because we trust the Lord Jesus, and we trust His Word. Let's wrap up with verse 17, because all of this, he says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took on our illnesses and bore our diseases uh, from Isaiah 53. It's an incredible chapter, right? It's, it's like Isaiah is at the pinnacle of, of, of the mountain and looking off into history and describing… Th- it's like he's standing on Mount Calvary itself as he describes what happens to the suffering servant. 700 years before Jesus was born. And he unfolds this this ministry of what Jesus had come to do as he bears our burdens upon himself. And he ties it to this miracle of healing, our illnesses and diseases. Where do diseases and sickness and death originate? In the garden? 
with sin. That wasn't God's design. And, and one of the cool things I did, I'm going to release it later, is COVID. It is so, it's going to be amazing. That's not, that was not it. There was no disease. It's part of life in a fallen world that will one day be wholly restored. There will be a new creation, a new heavens, a new earth. We look forward to that day, but that day is not here yet. And so we have these things that we deal with. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. He did this, Jesus did this by means of his vicarious suffering for sin. He became the substitute on the cross. He paid the price for us. And the root of every ill and everything that dishonors the Father was being dealt with there also. I I would submit that every time Jesus encountered illness and disease and distress and brokenness, he saw Calvary because that's why he came. The miracle behind the miracle is the incarnation that would lead to an atoning sacrifice on the cross and a victorious resurrection, which is our hope now and our hope forever. Surely He has carried our illnesses. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. goes a little further in Isaiah 53. Those two flow together. By His stripes we are healed. Does that mean if we are trusting in Jesus, we'll never get sick? That we'll never have a disease or an infirmity? If we have enough faith, that, that's not what it means. Here, here's the case in point. Have you ever met the leper that Jesus healed? How about Peter's mother-in-law, the centurion or his servant? Why? They're all dead, okay? Every single one of them. They got well, but at some point they died. And we will too until Jesus comes. We will too. So that's not what he's saying. But he's saying there's more to the story and that even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, it still doesn't win. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Jesus said, uh, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you may be also. Or Romans chapter 8 at the end, what will separate us from the love of God in Christ? And he goes through a list, and it's like, no, 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 nothing will ever do that. And there are many, many, many more passages we could look to. Our hope is in Christ. Matthew wants us to deal with this great question, who is Jesus? How you answer that question, who is Jesus, is critical. But it's not a shot in the dark. Matthew wants us to know him, as does Mark and Luke and John and the epistles. The Holy Spirit blesses his word that we would know Jesus as the incarnate God who came. And because he came, heaven will be filled. As the stars in the sky, as the sand on the sea, so are the descendants of Abram. God is doing a great work. Jesus did come down. He came down from the mountain, as verse 1 tells us, but it was more than that. He came down from glory. And He came down to us because we could never go up to Him. We could never work our way to Him. Every other religion in one way or another teaches that somehow you got to get better to work your way to get God's favor to earn it. And the distinction of Christianity is like the centurion says, Lord, I'm not worthy. But you speak it and it will be done. And on the cross, Jesus said, it is finished and it is done. An atonement was made. That's the miracle behind the miracles. And as Spurgeon says, may we be persuaded to believe greatly and none of us doubt the power of the incarnate Son of God. Amen. Amen. I agree with Spurgeon in that prayer.
that we would do just that very thing and trust the power of the incarnate Son of God, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Amen. Pastor Ray, again, preaching from God's Word, remind us that we've got a God who understands suffering because He put His only Son on a cross to suffer for you and me. And He welcomes our crying out to Him and asking that He would take away that suffering. And sometimes He does, but at a minimum, He's in the midst of that suffering and He's giving us grace that's sufficient um, to bear that suffering. Um, He's still a God of of miracles. God is still healing today. Most importantly, he's a God who heals inside, the heart, spiritual. If you don't know that healing, we would encourage you to cry out to him and ask him to give you the miracle of faith, the faith in none other than Jesus Christ. Please stand for uh, God's blessing uh, uh, based on Acts uh, chapter uh, 20, verse 32. May God and the word of his grace build you up and give you the inheritance amongst all those who are sanctified this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks for worshiping with us.